Welcome to a retrospective view of the Kelly family and principally of the descendants of Michael Kelly, who was born in Ireland in 1820 into a generation that would face the seminal event of the modern Irish nation. I'm Tim Kelly, and I proudly carry the surname of my great, great grandfather, Michael, who, as was stated by his countryman, William Butler Yeats, had a poor man's dream. Some 200 years after Michael's birth, I'm pleased to bring you our family's saga of faith, determination, and courage that shaped our immigrant nation. The Kelly name, it should come as no surprise, rose out of Ireland and is the family moniker taken on by the descendants of Kelly in the first millennium AD. The name itself has several proposed meanings, including warrior and bright-headed or red-headed. Irish surnames were anglicized in the late 1500s and thus the modern spelling of K-E-L-L-Y. This name and its variant spellings is the second most common surname in Ireland. Reflecting centuries of belief in the Catholic faith, the family crest highlights a motto stating, Terus Fortis, Mihi Deus, meaning, God is my tower of strength. There are actually many Kelly tribes or clans emerging out of Ireland. The most well known are the Kellys of High Manny in Western Ireland. The High Manny Kellys were a large and prosperous clan whose leader Teague fought and was killed, fighting with Brian Baru at the Battle of Clontarf in 1014. This clan are considered one of the four tribes of Ireland who battled and defeated the Viking invaders. The Kelly name is found throughout all 32 Irish counties and is most prevalent in the West, perhaps due to the ancient location of High Manny. The large scale immigration brought about by the Great Famine caused Kellys to be found throughout North America, Australia, New Zealand, and other far flung lands. During the 19th century, a large percentage of Irish families, probably the Kellys, dropped the somewhat redundant letter O from the beginning of their names. Ireland in the early 1800s had suffered for centuries under British rule and endured the oppression of their religion, language, and customs. Irish Gaelic still prevailed, however, outside of the cities. Some progress was made regarding religious freedom led by the efforts of Daniel O'Connell, known in Ireland as the Liberator. In the second decade of the 19th century, the first ancestor we can trace in our lineage, Michael Kelly, was born and baptized in Ireland. As mentioned, Ireland was a poor country at this time, having suffered under oppressive British rule. Most rural Irish were tenant farmers working for a British overlord. Michael met and married Anne Green, and like millions of their countrymen, were forced to leave their native soil. In 1847, in the midst of the Great Famine, they departed for the shores of America. In the mid 18th century, the Atlantic crossing on what were ominously called coffin ships was a harrowing one. Passengers embarked from a variety of Irish ports for the crossing to Boston, New York, and Philadelphia. Sanitation and privacy were almost nil for passengers on these ships. One can imagine the extreme difficulty of this journey and the relief experienced by those immigrants when the shores of America came into view. Michael and Anne arrived in Philadelphia, 
but by 1860 had settled in Port Kennedy, located on the Schuylkill River near Valley Forge, Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. Port Kennedy was an industrial village teeming with Irish immigrants. The focus of the area was lime mining and processing, as well as canal work. The area was a bustling place. The town broke up in the late 1800s when the lime deposits were depleted. The United States, and Philadelphia in particular, offered significantly more freedom to our ancestors, but the city was not without hardship. Anti-Irish and anti-Catholic bias was rife in the city, and violent riots occurred in Kensington during this period. Dublin-born Bishop Francis Patrick Kendrick was adept at gaining government support to protect his flock, and he, and his successor and later saint, John Newman, helped establish the church in support of the many immigrants and established a vast network of parishes and schools throughout the city. The Kellys settled in Philadelphia's Port Richmond section, not far from the docks of the Delaware River. Michael found work in the drayage trade and he and Anne raised four children. Both of his sons would likewise go on to be drivers. Michael died at the age of 57 and was buried in St. Anne's Cemetery in Port Richmond. The family later moved on to Brooklyn Street and finally Pemberton Street in Southwest Center City and survived into her 80s in the dawn of a new century. In 1857, the first native-born American of our family, John Peter Kelly, who it seems was called by his middle name, was born in Philadelphia. The firstborn of the family was followed by three surviving siblings. Mary, who lived well into her 90s and was well known for her gregarious personality, Joseph, and Rebecca. Only Peter married and carried on the family name. John Peter Kelly was born in pre-Civil War Philadelphia when Pennsylvania's James Buchanan was president, and there were only 31 states in the nation. Peter was said to be a heavy drinker. He began working as a cabbie and then spent most of his working career as a streetcar driver, an all-weather job that may have accounted for his desire to be whiskey warmed. The original streetcars in Philadelphia were horse-drawn and trackless omnibuses. Steel rail trolleys were present in Frankfurt and Southwark in 1857. Steel rails made for smoother and easier transit. From the 1870s on, Peter Kelly was a driver for horse-drawn trolleys. By the centennial year of 1876, Philadelphia had the largest streetcar network in the nation. Electrified trolleys appeared in the 1890s, but weren't fully replaced or didn't fully replace horse-drawn vehicles until 1897. Cable cars had been attempted in the 1880s, but these were deemed inferior to the electric trolleys. Augmented by the Market Frankfurt L, built in the early 20th century, trolleys would remain the primary means of mass transit in Philadelphia until after World War II. Peter married Anastasia Dawson, an Irish immigrant in Philadelphia on May 22, 1884. Peter and Annie gave birth to six children of whom three boys survived to adulthood, John, James Leo, and Frank. They lived in a typical row home at 331 East Tusculum Street in Kensington, 
quite near the Rocky House, made famous in the Academy Award-winning film. Peter passed away in 1923, and Annie followed her husband to eternal reward six years later. They are buried together in New Cathedral Cemetery on Front Neary Streets in Philadelphia. James Leo Kelly, who was known throughout his life as Leo, was the second surviving son of Peter and Annie. Leo, who quite probably was named for Leo XIII, the reigning pope at the time, enjoyed baseball as a young man and was a lifelong fan of the sport. In his early life, he worked with his hands, but his easygoing manner made him a natural salesman. And most of his career was spent as a subscription sales manager for the Prudential Life Insurance Company. Leo maintained a doll hospital in the basement of his home for extra money. This would help support family vacations. Perhaps owing to the intemperance of his father, Leo was a teetotaler, a rather rare trait of a Kelly family member. Leo spent his life primarily in Kensington, but in his later life, racked with arthritis, he lived in Mayfair and was able to winter in St. Petersburg Beach, Florida. In September 1917, as the United States was gearing up its involvement in World War I, Leo registered for the draft, but was not called. He married Elizabeth Patton of a large Kensington family. The Pattons, like the Kellys, were of Irish stock. The wedding mass was celebrated at the beautiful Ascension Parish Church on Allegheny Avenue. The Kellys would make their happy home on F Street for the next several decades. Leo and Lizzie brought four children into the world. In an era when infant mortality rates, four, four survived out of six. Marie, Francis, Elizabeth, and Vincent. Leo was able to provide for family vacations in Atlantic City. All four kids would go on to raise families and lead happy and productive lives. At the outbreak of World War II, Betty found work as a bookkeeper at Cramps Shipyard in Port Richmond. Frank and Vince both entered the Army and were based in England. Frank, who had attended Massbaum Technical School in Philadelphia, was a staff sergeant in charge of a hospital ward at the 157th General Hospital U.S. Army Forces in the British Isles, located in Birkenhead, near Liverpool. He witnessed much of the cruel and violent effects of war. Frank told a story of his younger brother coming to visit him at his hospital. Vince was assigned to the extremely hazardous duty of a bomber crew and told his older brother that their position in the squadron rotation placed his crew in significant peril. Meanwhile, the hospital was so busy at the time caring for wounded GIs due to the aftermath of the Battle of the Bulge, that Frank was forced to press his brother, who was on leave, into service to help care for the patients. Such was the mettle and commitment of the men of that era. When Frank and Vince parted, they knew they may never see each other again. Sergeant Vincent Kelly, at age 19, was the youngest member of a B-17 Flying Fortress crew assigned to the U.S. 8th Army Air Corps, based in England, where they carried out strategic bombing missions over targets of enemy targets in France, the Low Countries, and Germany, engaged in air-to-air -air fighter combat against enemy aircraft. In January 1945, Vince, 
a waste gunner, was on his 28th combat mission. Their B-17, nicknamed the Sleepy Lagoon, was damaged by enemy flak over Cologne, Germany, and the pilot managed to guide the plane to a crash landing in Ostensel, quite near the Zyder Z, in German-occupied Northwest Holland. Two of the crew remained with the plane, but thanks to assistance of locals who created false tracks in the snow to confuse the Germans, Vince and four other career, crew members, complete, uh, competently assisted by the Dutch underground, evaded the Germans. Vince lost an astounding 40 pounds during this time, which is known historically as Holland's hunger winter. The Dutch underground demonstrated incredible courage in caring for the Americans as some 20,000 Dutch citizens were executed for collaboration during this winter. An Allied counteroffensive commenced in March, and finally, on April 16th, the underground delivered the American airmen to an advanced unit of the Canadian Army. Nazi Germany surrendered three weeks later. The dictionary provides an apt word for men like this. Hero. While Vince was missing in action, it is said that his dad and sister Marie attended Mass every day in hopes that the good Lord would send them home. Their joy at the news of his safety is unimaginable. In the much welcomed peacetime that followed, life in Philadelphia once again focused on normal affairs. Nature took its course and Leo's kids in turn marched to the altar. Betty married veteran John McMenamin, Frank wed Kitty Walsh of Glen Olden, Delaware County. Vince married neighbor girl Claire Kelly with a coincidental same last name. And Marie tied the knot with Charles Rankin. Faithful to the biblical decree to be fruitful and multiply, Leo and Lizzie's offspring contributed 21 souls to the family's fourth American generation. Having lost his wife Lizzie while she was still quite young, Leo persevered in raising his family. Frank's wife Kitty recalled that Leo took his children and their spouses out to dinner in 1967 to mark the 50th anniversary of his marriage to his wife who had passed away 30 years previously. Quite a testament to marital love. Leo met his maker at the age of 85, having led a meaningful life in a breathtaking era that spanned horse-drawn carriages to man walking on the moon. Leo and Lizzie's children are part of an era often referred to as the greatest generation. There is much evidence to support this assertion. Marie, Frank, Betty, and Vince were reared during the Great Depression, lost their mother in their youth, and served their nation during the worst war in history. They kept the faith and inspired their children and grandchildren to aspire to the important things in life, faith, family, and country. In the post-war era, Michael Kelly's descendants emerged as the family's fourth American generation during the baby boomer era. This generation likewise faced its shares, challenges, and difficulties, but also achieved a level of success that Michael could never have imagined, and we could suppose he would have been overwhelmed with pride. And so Michael Kelly's legacy survives and flourishes into a new century. Contemporary descendants carry on a legacy of values rooted in Irish heritage, Catholic faith, and American democracy.
I completed this presentation in 2021, some 200 years after the birth of my great-great-grandparents in the Emerald Isle, carrying forward to about 1975. In recounting this history, I am overwhelmed with a sense of pride in our Kelly forebears, who sacrificed so much to ensure improved opportunities for our generation and those that will succeed us. The courage, faith, and perseverance of our ancestors provide an object lesson of selflessness and courage. I want a special, special thanks to my cousin Terry McMenamin and to his late mom, my godmother, Betty Kelly McMenamin for providing so many pictures and insights and cousin Kathy Kelly and all my cousins and siblings who contributed. I'm Tim Kelly, a great, great grandson of Michael and Ann Kelly of Ireland. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. Terrace Fortis, Mihi Deus.